Hello, I'm uh, Mike Mayer and I head up the Global Scale of English at Pearson. Thank you for joining the event today. Um, and I will be talking to you a little bit about the background to the research uh, that we've been carrying out over the past four years. Um, speak a bit about how it, it can be used to support teaching in the classroom. And then um, I'll demonstrate to you and show you some of the online resources that we've developed for teachers to use on English.com. So if we move on. Um, so I'd like to start by uh, talking about the ways in which we define uh, learner proficiency. And um, if we go back to, for me, which was the beginning of being a teacher, which was in the 1980s, when I was teaching in France, um, a lot of people were using this course by Cambridge, the Cambridge English course. And it came in three levels. And those levels were beginner, intermediate and advanced. And that really was the terminology that we used to describe learner proficiency. I then left France, went off to do a postgraduate uh, qualification. And when I came back to ELT, Many people were using this course, Headway from Oxford. And um, you'll notice that we now had five levels and those levels were beginner, pre-intermediate, intermediate, upper intermediate and advanced. So still quite general terms to describe proficiency, but there was a recognition that actually intermediate level, you needed more than one course book to take learners from intermediate to advanced and the fact that the term intermediate in particular intermediate covers such a wide range of proficiency levels so there was an opportunity to support teachers by giving them more um, lessons uh, more lesson times more course levels uh, to support learners through intermediate level but because we had these very generic terms like beginner, intermediate and advanced, it was quite difficult as a teacher to know whether or not an intermediate book from Pearson or Cambridge or Oxford was the same level as an intermediate book from another publisher, Macmillan or Cengage. Um, and in fact, as a teacher who had some experience of selecting course books, there was actually a realization that books labeled intermediate were not all the same level. Some seem to be more challenging. They seem to be a, a, a harder intermediate level. And so it was against this background that in the 1990s, uh, research was carried out um, to really establish um, a more accurate description of learner proficiency. And so I'm sure everybody is familiar now with the Common European Framework. Um, that research um, involved teachers rating learning objectives. Some examples you can see on the screen there. So these learning objectives have become known as the can-do statements because of the, the, the form in which they're written, can follow short, simple written directions, can write very simple personal letters. So teachers were given these uh, learning objectives and they were asked to rate them for difficulty. So grades. And so for each student, they were asked to select learning objectives that that student could do. So from the strongest students down to the weakest students, that data was collected together data was crunched, it was then adopted by the Council of Europe and published in 2001 as the Common European Framework. And so as part of this presentation, I'm actually going to ask you a few questions. And because this is a recording, if you would like to take longer to think about each of the questions, then please just pause the recording. I'll give you an opportunity to pause and then I'll move on. So my first question is, do you know where the common European research was carried out? 
Was it carried out in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, or in Switzerland? And if you want some time to think about that, please pause your recording now. Okay, so here's a clue. And no, that isn't the United Kingdom, that is indeed Switzerland. Um, and I think this is an interesting fact because Switzerland is a very small country in Europe with a very interesting language culture with four national official languages. Um, but it is a very small country and I think it's quite surprising to know that research carried out in this very small country in Europe has gone on to have a huge impact on the way in which English language in particular, but all languages are being taught and have been taught since the publication of the Common European Framework. So <clears throat> given that the Common European Framework is now the dominant framework for language teaching around the world, not just in Europe, but Latin America, in Asia, in the Middle East, why is it that we felt that we wanted to develop something different, potentially different? Um, one of the main reasons is that, um, as is true for anything which is adopted, implemented, has a certain amount of success, there are always critics and there are people who raise limitations about something. It doesn't do this. This isn't appropriate for my learners. So. With the Global Scale of English uh, project, what we uh, sought to do was actually to try and address some of the limitations that have been leveled against the Common European Framework. And on your screen now, you can see some of those areas that we wanted to address. Firstly, as the title suggests, Common European Framework was developed in Europe for a European learning environment. Teaching English in Latin America or teaching English in the Middle East or Asia can be very different. It's a very different learning context. So we wanted at least to validate the data in the Common European Framework as being suitable to support teaching in those non-European contexts. The Common European Framework was developed for adults and young adults. So really learners above the age of uh, 15, 15, 16. It was never intended to support teaching young learners. So young learners in the K-12, the primary and secondary uh, school age levels. Common European Framework was never intended to be used with those learners. Now, many people have tried to adapt those um, learning objectives for young learners, and I'm sure any, anyone listening to this presentation who's teaching young learners will have used textbooks which have Common European Framework on the cover. But just to say that the Common European Framework originally was not created to support the teaching of young learners. Common European Framework was aimed at teaching general English to adult learners. Um, there is what they call a domain. So one area, uh, one context is work and one domain is study. But if you're teaching English for academic purposes or English for business or specific purposes, you have very little information in the Common European Framework to support that teaching. So we thought that was an area in which we were, would be able to, to do something. There is an uneven distribution of the can-do learning objectives across the four skills. So one skill has more information than any of the other skills, and we'll look at that. <clears throat> The Common European Framework levels are quite wide and so they take many hours, indeed years, to master. And so we also wanted to address that issue of motivating learners to, to demonstrate to them that they are making progress when they constantly appear to be at the same level. And finally, when Common European Framework was published, there was no information to cover the very 
early stages of language learning. So A1 as the lowest level, there is no information below A1, whereas A1 already assumes a certain level of language ability before you can start measuring learners. Not a huge problem in Europe where learners often get to A1 quite quickly, but in other parts of the world, learners can spend quite a bit of time below A1. So again, we wanted to address that area. So the next question is, how many levels are there in the Common European Framework? Is it six, nine, 10, or 11? And just a word of warning, if you think you know the answer, maybe just think a little bit harder because it might be not be the obvious answer that you think it is. If you want more time, then I suggest you pause the recording now. So when the Common European Framework was published, it was published as six levels. And most people think of the six levels of the Common European Framework. A1, A2, basic user B1, B2, independent user C1, C2, proficient user. So I would say six is probably the answer that most people would give. However, if you have read the Common European Framework Manual, you will know, or you should know, that there are in fact nine levels because A2, B1 and B2 are actually two levels. So there is A2 and A2+, plus, B1, B1+, plus, B2, B2+. Plus. And that doesn't mean that A2 was divided into two levels. What it means is that two levels were combined to form A2. And I think this is an important detail because I'm sure everybody's had the experience of learners who begin learning a language and appear to move through A1 quite quickly. And then when you hit A2, and particularly B1, there is this impression that learning slows down or even stops. And that's a feeling for teachers and I think for learners. You have the impression that you're not making any progress. There are a number of factors as to why that happens. But one of the factors is the fact that A2, B1 and B2 are bigger than A1. So we shouldn't be surprised if learners are taking longer to move between A2 and B1 or between B1 and B2. And then if anybody's read the original research carried out in Switzerland, um, you will know that there was originally in that research information below A1. So there was a level known as tourist level below A1. However, when the Council of Europe published the, the research findings, uh, there was a decision not to include that information. So if you had six, nine or 10, I think you probably have a correct answer in there. Okay, next question. Which language skill do you think has the most can-do statements? Is it reading, listening, speaking, or writing? If you need more time, please pause your recording now. It's speaking. Around two-thirds of the information in the Common European Framework is about speaking. And across all of the four skills, around two thirds of the information again is for the levels A2, B1, B2. So this means if you are using the Common European Framework to support teaching or you're using it to inform assessment, if you're assessing or teaching reading at A1, you have very little information that you can draw on in the Common European Framework. So again, we thought that was a, there was an opportunity there to be able to do something. OK, so this um, diagram on the on your screens now shows the, the, the slope of language learning from the very early stages up to mastery. The little blue dots on the screen are the learners and the white arrows are the can do statements from the common European framework, which describe what learners can do at different levels of proficiency. 
Um, we have the six levels there. Notice A2, B1, B2, wider than A1. And we have three learners, learner one, learner two, learner three. If you're using the Common European Framework to define learner proficiency, learner one and learner two are defined as the same level. They are both A2. Learner three is a higher level, B1. The reality is that two and three obviously are closer together in proficiency, but when you only have six points of reference on a scale, you have to group people with quite differing levels of proficiency together. So what we wanted to do was to take the common European framework, framework proficiency scale and take it back to a more granular numerical scale that would enable us to show differences in proficiency within one of those common European framework levels. So on your screens now, you can see um, the, on the right hand side, you have the, the global scale of English. So that is a proficiency scale from 10 to 90, which is aligned to the common European framework. On the left hand side in the table, you have a column called Logit. Now Logit is the research data from that project in Switzerland. So the original project that was behind the common European framework. And you can see that we have a proficiency scale that goes from minus 5.39 to plus 3.8. It's not terribly motivating, I don't think, to tell a learner, well, your level is minus 3.23, but you know, if you work really hard this year, you might get to minus 3.01. Giving a learner a negative <laughs> number is not motivating. So what we've done is we've taken that original Common European Framework proficiency scale and transformed it onto a positive scale. So the minus 5.39 to the plus 3.8 scale is exactly the same scale as 10 to 90. It's not a new scale. It's exactly the same scale, just expressed in positive numbers. So this is really for the, the to the point I was making earlier about why is Pearson trying to do something different to the common European framework. The point is it's not different. It's exactly the same as the common European framework. But what it's doing is extending the common European framework and giving teachers more information to support teaching the vet all four skills and to measure progress within a common European framework level. So, <clears throat> and you may want to pause the recording after this slide, um, how many hours of instruction do you think it takes to move between A1 and A2? So from the bottom of A1 to the top of A2. How many hours of teaching? If you want more time, please pause your recording. No, oh, no, don't, sorry, don't pause your own recording. I have some uh, options. Is it about 50 hours? Is it about 100 hours? Is it about 200 hours? Or is it about 400 hours? So now pause the recording if you want more time. Um, so roughly 100 hours. Um, and uh, this, these numbers, by the way, they're not numbers that I've just invented. We have research for these numbers and I'll be sharing with you the website where you can find the report on, on the research into how long it takes to progress through the levels of the Common European Framework. So around 100 hours at uh, A1 to A2. What do you think um, happens when you move to B1, trying to move from B1 to B2? How many hours there? So again, is it about 50? Is it about 100? Is it about 200? Is it about 400? Please pause your recording now if you want more time. So it's around 400 hours, 380 hours. 
and on your screen now you can actually see the range so from A1 to A2 it, it is somewhere between 95 and 480 hours and B1 between 380 and 1100 hours the differences between those two sets of uh, numbers um, the faster learner so 95 and 380 that is someone who has a language which is quite similar to English in structure same pronunciations same writing system and that learner is motivated and that learner has high exposure to English so maybe two days every week uh, two hours every day the slower learner is a learner who has a first language that's very different to English um, this learner is also not motivated and this learner only has one or two hours of English every week so low exposure to English um, but as you can see those numbers particularly when you get to the B level you are at B1 for a long time even as a, a learner with a first language quite similar to English so you start the academic year you're b1 and the next year you're b1 and the next year you're b1 and the next year you're b1 and and it appears as if learning has stopped or slowed down dramatically on the left hand side of your screen you see some numbers which are um, estimates for how many hours it takes to make three points progress on that 10 to 90 scale the global scale of english so what I'm not saying is that using the global scale of English, you will make progress faster. But what I am saying is that if you use the global scale of English, you will be able to demonstrate to learners that they're making progress more regularly. So you might start the year at 43 and at the end of the year, you're 47 and the end of the following year, you're 51 and the end of the following year, you're 55 yes you are still b1 but by using that granular scale you can measure within b1 and demonstrate to the learner hang on in there you are getting closer to b2 and as everybody knows who's learned a language the only um, real way the, there's no miracle way to learn a language you just have to persevere and keep on learning so um, we talked about uh, speaking having the most number of learning objectives and learning objectives being mainly for uh, general English for adults nothing for young learners so we wanted to set about uh, creating learning objectives for to extend the common European framework so this is what we did we looked at course materials we looked at syllabuses we looked at national curricula um, and we created new can-do learning objectives and these learning objectives we followed a similar methodology to the common European framework and we sent them out to teachers around the world to rate for difficulty um, and obviously when they in the 1990s when the common European research was carried out common European framework research was carried out there was no internet so it was very hard to engage an international audience today it's much easier and so we've been able to get data from teachers from over 50 countries around the world um, and, and more than six and a half thousand teachers and where those teachers agree over 80 percent of the time we include that data in our learning objectives database and where they don't agree it's rejected so only where there's agreement around the world do we include the information and so I'd like to just uh, show you now some learning objectives and um, give you a little an opportunity to engage with those learning objectives so here we have a um, set of five writing learning objectives and what I'd like you to do is order them from the easiest to the most difficult so the easiest one to the most difficult and just write down a set of numbers three two five one four four one three two five that type of thing so I suggest you pause the recording now and um, start it again once you have your order
and this is the correct order for writing descriptors. And the same for speaking. Pause your recording now if you want more time. And this is the order for the speaking descriptors. <clears throat> So, as I said, we've collected data in from over six and a half thousand teachers, and here is what we've produced. We now have four sets of learning objectives. Um, we have a set for adults learning general English, so that's the one closest to the Common European Framework. We have a set for adults learning academic English. We have a set for adults learning business English. And we have a new set for learners, uh, for young learners. Um, and the charts on the right hand side of the screen, um, they show the dark blue shows the information that we've included from the Common European Framework and the light blue is uh, indicates the new information that we've added. So the, the database is now around four times bigger than the Common European Framework. It has around 2000 learning objectives across those uh, four sets. And so this has been created to support our vision of um, learning, teaching and assessing English. So we have the English, uh, the Global Scale of English Proficiency Scale, GSE. We have the sets of learning objectives, which tell us what learners can do at different levels of proficiency. We then use that information to create courses. So the course books are now aligned to the global scale of English. And then you have various assessment tools which can measure progress and achievement on the global scale of English, ranging from placement tests through progress tests, which measure small increments in progress throughout the uh, academic year, and then high state tests high stake tests like Pearson Test of English Academic. So using learning objectives, how do uh, teachers use learning objectives? So you can just think um, about whether or not you use learning objectives in your teaching. And then maybe pause for a moment to articulate to yourselves, write down exactly how do you use learning objectives in your teaching. I'm going to give you some suggestions that we've collected from other workshops, but if you want more time to think about your own use of learning objectives, please pause the recording now. Okay, so here are some of the um, ways in which teachers use learning objectives. Number one, and, and a lot of these may seem obvious to more experienced teachers, but um, I think it's worth sharing them anyway. Ensure that your, learn it, your lesson has a clear learning objective. Any lesson, you should know why am I teaching this lesson? What am I expecting the learners to be able to do by the end of the lesson? Ensure that your materials, the materials that you're using, have a clear learning objectives. Increasingly, Textbooks, publishers include these learning objectives, I, objectives either in the uh, student's book or in the teacher's manual. So you're often given support in identifying the learning objective, but you can actually go through materials with the learning objectives and just check for yourself which, uh, which skills are being tested in a, a unit or a chapter of a course book. It's quite um, a laborious task, but it's something that we do with, with our materials as well. This one might seem obvious, but ensure that what you're assessing is in fact what you are teaching. So use the learning objectives to link assessments with teaching. Um, share the lesson objectives with your students. So there's an increasing body of research which suggests that if you share learning objectives with students, they will actually perform better. So this ties in with the 21st century skills of engaging learners in the learning process, getting them to take ownership for their own learning 
And one way in which you can do this is by actually sharing the learning objective with the students. Um, as a teacher, ensure that your lesson has some form of activity in it that enables you to informally assess that the learning objective has been achieved in the lesson. You cannot assume that because you've taught something that the learner has learned it. So what activity have you included in your lesson so that you are able to see that they have actually um, mastered what you have been teaching? And then maybe if you're focusing on a spoken learning objective, you, in that particular class, you don't need to worry too much about the grammar. So you don't need to correct every grammatical error if your focus is on a speaking skill. Um, using learning objectives to help demonstrate that learners are making progress. I think for learners, it's very motivating to know that they have actually learned something. So this example comes from uh, Japan, actually, where um, there's very low confidence levels when it comes to learning English. Um, they have a, a they're quite um, famous in Asia for being the lowest level of English language learners in, in Asia, and they have a, a bit of a, a stigma about that, and it affects confidence levels. Um, so um, one of our teachers uh, took a set of learning objectives that she was planning to cover in the semester, and she asked the learners to just rate, self-evaluate against each of those learning objectives how confident they felt about doing them. She then took that away, used that information to inform what she focused on during the semester, and then at the end of the semester gave them the same list and asked them to do the same self-evaluation. So how, how confident do you feel doing each of these things now? And then gave them the original sheet back so they had some tangible evidence of where their confidence levels had grown throughout, throughout the semester. Quite obvious, use the learning objectives to plan courses and, and curricula. Um, and you can do that check, the audit of your learning materials to see what they're covering and then maybe supplement with additional learning objectives if you have the opportunity and the time. So if a course book says that it's B1, no course book can cover every learning objective at B1. So you will find other skills at the same proficiency level, which are not necessarily covered in your course. So by checking the lists of learning objectives, you have opportunities to supplement the materials um, where you think appropriate. And then more and more teachers are being uh, asked to, to uh, report on what they're teaching during an academic year. And so the learning objectives are a useful shorthand way to report to your ac academic director, director of study, or even to, to parents. Sometimes for parents, they might need to be translated, um, but they're, they're a useful shorthand for reporting. And so these learning objectives are all available for you to download uh, online um, at a website which is very easy to remember, and you'll see it at the end of the recording. It's english.com. Not, not difficult to remember. So these are PDFs. You can print them off and use them to support your teaching. Or you can use a database which is online, which is also free, and which is also at english.com. And I just want to, in the uh, last few, well, the last five, ten minutes, is to walk you through what you will find in the teacher toolkit and how you can use it to support your teaching. So the first thing you will do is select the type of learner that you're teaching. Is this general English? Is it academic English? Is it professional English? Are you teaching young learners? So select your type of learner. <clears throat> you then have a slider and you can select the level of your students. And if you wish, you can focus on just one skill. So just reading, writing, listening or speaking. So in this example, I've selected general adult learners and I've selected a level which is a high A1, low A2. And I want to focus on, sorry, going back, I want to focus on, I think it's listening. So I've selected listening and uh, you'll see there were 11 learning objectives that you might consider teaching at that level for listening. 
If you search for speaking or writing, you can click on the arrow at the side of the screen to get some more information. And the extra information includes the grammar that is related to that particular functional skill. So if you want your learners to be able to do that particular function in English, here's some grammar that you need to ensure that they know already or that you may need to pre-teach uh, before they, they are able to, to perform that particular function. Um, you can download your results and the download contains a QR code so you can scan those results and have them on your mobile device. The online database also contains information on grammar and vocabulary and this works in very much the same way. So for grammar, select the level of your learners and then you can select a particular grammatical category. So here we have modal verbs and maybe selecting not all the modal verbs but just those relating to obligation. And again, at that particular level, you have seven learning objectives to choose from. You can click again on additional information and here you will have example sentences of how that grammar is used and then a link to functional uh, can do functional learning objectives. If you want to practice that grammar in a particular language function, this links the grammar back to the language function. So the opposite way as we had before. And for grammar, you can click on free resources and there you will find a number of worksheets, lesson plans that target that particular piece of grammar. Again, they're just uh, PDFs. You can download the PDF and use it to supplement whichever courses you're using. For vocabulary, um, again, much the same way, you can select the level of your learners. Uh, the vocabulary database is divided into topics um, and um, vocabulary is analyzed by word meaning, not just by word form. And by that I mean, for example, the word table, the word form table, you have the meaning of the piece of furniture that you eat off. Obviously that's quite low level, but then you also have tables like a chart or a graph in a book that is at a higher level of proficiency. So you can see the different word meanings at different levels of proficiency. So here's an example, the environment. If you call it the environment at B1, you can see there is a, you know, a selection of vocabulary that you might consider teaching to your learners at B1. Um, all the vocabulary contains definitions and you can have click for more information and this extra information includes collocation so you can see the words that are frequently used together um, with that particular word meaning. Um, we are releasing a new uh, version of the teacher toolkit uh, next week and from next week you will also have the audio pronunciations for each of these words so you'll see little icons next to each word and you can click on the icon and hear the pronunciation in both British and American English. And the vocabulary also contains what we call functional language, functional phrases, so ways to, in this example, uh, express an opinion, giving an opinion. If you want to vary your learner's vocabulary from constantly saying, I think, I think, I think, you can call up lists of uh, alternative phrases some will be spoken, some will be written, they'll differ in register, but it will help you select um, alternative phrases which are appropriate at particular levels of proficiency. And so, as I said, all of this information is available on our website. So there it is on your screen, english.com and then slash GSE, Global Scale of English. Um, it contains those PDFs of the learning objectives to download. It contains the GSE Teacher Toolkit and it also contains a host of other documents to support your teaching. So there's an interactive guide on how to use the Teacher Toolkit. There are white papers which describe how we've developed the learning objectives, how we've developed the vocabulary, how we've developed the grammar. There's um, an assessment framework 
So the assessment framework is a set of um, criteria, a set of rubrics which enable you as a teacher to informally assess speaking and writing in the classroom. So what is the difference between a, somebody who's speaking at an A2 level and somebody who's speaking at an A2 plus level? How are they different when you look at accuracy, fluency, range of vocabulary, complexity, coherence? So um, I would recommend taking a look at that document um, to help you assess speaking and writing in the classroom. Uh, the current document is for adult learners and from um, next month you will have a parallel document for young learners so we're, we're, we will be we've just fi finalized the assessment framework for young learners um, this this week so that will be uploaded next month and then finally on your screen you can see a document there how long does it take to learn a language so that's the document that I use to pull those figures of uh, 100, 400 hours that we saw in a previous slide. And then finally, I just wanted to share one um, exciting piece of news for us. So um, some of you may be aware that the Common European Framework has uh, recently been updated. So it was published in 2001 and in September 2017, they released a companion volume which can be found on the Council of Europe website and you have the link on your screens now. Um, so that companion volume um, supplements the existing Common European Framework. So nothing has been removed from the Common European Framework, but additional can-do statements have been added. Um, and so there's been an addition of quite a number of uh, can-do learning objectives for mediation, so translation, interpretation, mediating between two uh, speakers of other languages, that type of thing. Um, they have now included the tourist level, the level below A1, called pre-A1. And I think this is because of the demand from markets outside of Europe where that very low level of language learning is important and learners spend quite a bit of time at that level. And then, Exciting for us is that um, they are very supportive of the work that we've been carrying out with the Global Scale of English. And so the companion volume also includes 50 learning objectives that are taken from the Global Scale of English. Um, and for me, this makes my uh, life uh, much easier when I'm talking to teachers to really convince them that what we've done is not something that competes with the common European framework, but it actually works together with the common European framework. And as I mentioned before, having a more granular scale aligned to the common European framework and having more learning objectives enables uh, teachers to measure proficiency within those wider common European framework levels. And so that brings us to the end of today's presentation. I thank you so much for your attention. Um, and you can see english.com slash GSE on your screens now. Um, please go to that website, explore the information, uh, download the PDFs, register for the teacher toolkit. It's all free um, and we hope that it will help you um, in your teaching. Thank you so much.